Well, guys, welcome once again to our e-service here coming from our living room uh, in Truckee. And uh, as uh, those of you that are familiar with this know, I like to use visuals with my messages. And so we've got the screen behind me. Uh, if you're able to put it in uh, full screen mode uh, on your YouTube, uh, you'll be able to see the screen and what's uh, I, the notes and things that I have visually uh, all that much better. Um, so here we go. I, I'm going to do a, a short series in one of uh, Paul's uh, less familiar letters, and that's his letter uh, to Philemon. And so if you want to pick up your Bible, turn to Philemon. It's uh, right there uh, just before we come to Hebrews, and you'll find it, and uh, you can go with me. It's, it's a unique uh, in all of Paul's letter because even though... Uh, it was intended to be read to uh, the church. It was clearly addressed, especially to his friend Philemon, uh, about a mutual, uh, uh, I would say, friend or acquaintance, Onesimus. And so let's pray. And I want to talk a little bit about the context then before we launch into the actual uh, passage itself. So again, that's Philemon. And uh, before we actually do that, uh, I wasn't going to let this slide. We have a memory verse that we do each month. And our memory verse for this month of March is Jeremiah 29, 11. So, uh, so if you're with yourself or maybe with your family watching, uh, please repeat this after me. It's part of memorizing. Okay, Jeremiah 29, 11, 1, 2, 3. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future, Jeremiah 29.11. Uh, I like the way that comes out in the New International, and so that's what we're using. So one more time together, uh, one, two, three. For I know the plans I have concerning you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Okay, Jeremiah 29, 11. And so now let's get into the introduction to Philemon. But first, let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for the technology, Lord, that allows us to meet and gather in this way. Thank you also that the technology allows us to post comments and to have a conversation and dialogue both during the service and following the service. So Lord, we again uh, come to you with confidence um, asking that you would take, Lord, all that we offer, all that we do, all that we bring, Lord, and by your Spirit transform it, that it would glorify you and, and build up, Lord, your people. Uh, guide my words direct this time, Lord, to your glory, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. And yes, just a reminder as I prayed, you can comment during uh, the message, although probably what works better is you'll be thinking of things that you want to maybe talk about a little bit or, or that you got out or that the Lord spoke to you or a question. And so we'll allow a few minutes, uh, 10, 15 minutes at the end of the message uh, in order we can continue our dialogue. So it's kind of cool uh, to be able to do that. So uh, Philemon. Paul, as you know, once he came to know the Lord, uh, he was zealous for the law, but then he became zealous for Jesus Christ. And he w became aware that God had a special call on his life. And when we follow forward in the book of Acts, which we're uh, teaching through uh, and studying together on Thursday nights, when we go through that, we, uh, of course, come to his missionary journeys, and we have the three missionary journeys of Paul. And then after his third missionary journey, he came home and uh, was so anxious because he grew up Jewish. He, he, he studied at the feet of Gamaliel. It was like, for us, it's like saying you went to, to Harvard or you went to Yale. And, and uh, he went to share, but they were so against him. Uh, there was the riot that happened in the temple. And, and so he was incarcerated and ultimately he appeals to Caesar. And so then he is taken. We have that journey to Rome towards the end of the book of Acts. And all of that gets uh, Paul to Rome, where we refer to that as his first Roman imprisonment. 
uh, and it was a more mild imprisonment. He was actually able to rent his own um, apartment, but he was chained to at least one. Uh, typically, it would have been two soldiers, but a minimum of one soldier, he would have been chained. Uh, but he was able to receive guests, he was able to write. And so during that time, he wrote those letters, uh, Philippians, uh, Ephesians, Colossians, which we refer to as the prison epistles. And uh, he also wrote Philemon, uh, this book that we're looking. So it's, it's uh, included both often among the prison epistles, because he was in prison when he wrote it, but also sometimes it's included in the pastoral epistles because this is a pastoral letter, not one written to a young pastor, but it's, it's, we see a glimpse in Philemon of Paul ministry, not so much as the apostle declaring the truth and setting things right in the church, but it's Paul dealing with the personal pastoral issue uh, between members of the church. And so it's a unique letter in that way as well. So while Paul, as we put the pieces together, what emerges is that while Paul was probably still in transit to Rome for his first imprisonment, back in the uh, city of Colossia, and we have Paul's letter to the Colossians, which is, goes along with Philemon. But there, there was a, a wealthy member of the church, Philemon, uh, who obviously had a house that was suitable for church meetings, and so he hosted the church there. Philemon, being wealthy, he had a household that included household servants or slaves. Uh, now, we're not going to get into the whole issue of slavery per se, uh, because there's so many nuances and, and different aspects of it. But from a practical sense of understanding uh, maid servants and other things in a household at that time, in the good sense, uh, in some ways uh, where we would uh, have our kitchen appliances, they would have servants that would take care of the things to help prepare the food or instead of having uh, our clothes, <laughs> clothes washing machine, uh, washing machines, they would have somebody that would wash the, so just to understand how that would work. Um, but still, uh, a servant was a servant and a slave was a slave, and there was a commitment and a mutual responsibility. So, Onesimus, whose name means useful, which was actually a very common name uh, for slaves, Onesimus was a part of the household for Philemon, and he ran away. He ran away, and in the Roman Empire, a runaway slave um, is in big trouble. Now, they uh, legally would have the right, if they captured a runaway slave, uh, the master had the right all the way to capital punishment or severe penalties uh, and inflicting great pain and uh, even uh, damage uh, and wounding uh, the servants and slaves. So... Uh, where would you go? That's normally what you do is you look for a big city to get lost in. And so Onesimus apparently uh, clearly made his way all the way to Rome. And now Colossae is in modern day Turkey. So he made his way all to, the, to Rome. And somewhere in Rome, uh, through the ministry of Paul, either directly somebody bringing him to Paul or more likely, you know, through someone that was ministering on Paul's behalf on, in, in the church and road there, Onesimus found the Lord. And so he, he not only found the Lord, but he became zealous for Jesus and wanted to serve the Lord, which what a wonderful thing, you know, in, in that image of we may be serving other things, but ultimately we come to Jesus, we discover the wonderful freedom and fulfillment that comes in when we actually become servants of Jesus. So in that, Onesimus then connected with Paul and made himself useful, as his name says, now useful for the gospel, useful for Paul. And at some point, of course, Paul finds out that, well, Onesimus is a runaway slave uh, and that his master, of all things, was Philemon, who Paul knew personally, had a, a wonderful, loving relationship with. And so I'm sure you can imagine the kinds of discussions, maybe the agonizing that might have happened with Onesimus between Paul, as Paul would finally have to say, you know, 
Um, I, I know that this is genuine. Uh, I know that you are sorry for what you've done and, and the cost and damage you've caused your master uh, and that the Lord has forgiven you, but we've got to make this right. And we've got to make it right with Philemon. I can't just benefit from your help here without Philemon's consent. And more than that, you are now his brother and you need to get it right. And so, uh, so then he sends um, Onesimus back to Colossia to his master Philemon. Now along with him, he sends Tychicus who has the letter to the Colossians and the Ephesians. Uh, those letters that have a lot of parallels, uh, they're being sent by Tychicus then to be brought to the churches there. And in that context, then he's going to do that with Philemon. And so you can imagine the trepidation uh, involved there. But, you know, let me say, um, as a pastor for many years and all the kinds of things you get involved in doing quite a bit of uh, counseling, um, there have been many times when uh, I've had to counsel someone to take a step like this uh, with great risk. Because Onesimus, I mean, he, yeah, Philemon had the right to put him to death, had the right to lock him up, to put him in bonds, to make his life miserable. Um, and that was a risk, the very real risk he's taken. And I've had those that have broken the law or done very seriously stolen from people, wrong people, in ways that they could end up in jail. And yet uh, they've come to the Lord. The Lord's convicted them. They know they need to make it right. And, and it's, it, it's a serious, agonizing thing, but it's also a wonderful thing to watch someone trust the Lord to that degree. For me, often a key verse, and that is Proverbs 28, 13, that says, He who conceals his sin shall not prosper, but whoever confesses and renounces shall obtain mercy. And that's the, I have seen that. I have seen time and time again the, that the mercy of God is, is tremendously lavish when we will own our sin and bring it to him. It's incredible what I've seen. And maybe you're in that place. Maybe there's something you know you need to make right and you're just kind of, I don't know, I don't know. Well, go to Proverbs 28, 13. Submit yourself to the Lord and get ready. If you're sincere and you take it, um, get ready to watch the Lord. Just get ready to watch the, the mercy of God be poured out. So, that's the context when Onesimus shows up at Philemon's door and household. He's got this letter from Paul, which I, I, I'm sure, who knows what Philemon's response would be when he saw Onesimus. Uh, and I'm sure if I were in his, Onesimus' shoes, I would have said, quick, here, read the letter. I'm so sorry. Who knows? I would have gotten down on my knees Probably he had Tychicus with us, and Tychicus was probably one that was the buffer. Philemon, here, quick, read this. It's from Paul. So that is our context uh, as we get into Philemon. It's a one-chapter book. And so we're going to look at the greeting, first of all, today. That's the first seven verses. It's a warm greeting for good friends. This is before then Paul gets to the the, the real topic and his request that he's going to make of his good friend Philemon. So again, Philemon uh, chapter 1, verse 1, starts with Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus and Timothy, our brother. So uh, we see who the letter's from. It's from Paul. And Paul often would include Timothy, even though uh, here is uh, elsewhere it's clear that uh, Paul is really the author of the letter. So Paul, uh, and of course, We've been studying various books written by Paul through the Holy Spirit, so we won't spend a lot of uh, time on him, but just a quick reminder. I love this part of Philippians where he gives his uh, religious spiritual resume and, and the complete change of attitude that took place when he found Jesus. So in Philippians 3, picking up with verse 5, he says, I was circumcised the eighth day, according to the law. I was of the stock of Israel, 
of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, which meant he spoke the Hebrew language, concerning the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. You know, outward religiousness, he was blameless. But, verse 7, what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Verse 8, yet indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and I count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in Him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. And so, uh, Wow, uh, that's so awesome uh, to see this change. He, he said, I, I zealously wanted to know God. I had a sense of God's call on my life. We see that in Galatians. Uh, and so I did all that I could do, but that's never enough. Instead, he discovered that God, it's not about what we do for God, it's what God has done for us in Jesus and the benefits of that that give us that relationship that we can strive with religion and our own works forever. Or, you know, if, if you're coming from more of a, a broader worldly perspective, you know, whether it's the mantras you chant, the exercises you do, whether it's the attempts of, you know, holistic spirituality, all of those are just different forms on our part trying to connect with God or ultimate reality. I mean, I was there before I came to know Jesus Christ. I was seeking all kinds of religious experience, spiritual experience, you know, all kinds of ways through uh, chanting and mantras, incense, I could go on. All that seeking to find uh, ultimate reality. And I was so surprised and so it's been so awesome ever since that it was in Jesus Christ. So we see that in Paul. Now with Timothy, if we look at some of the uh, descriptions given of Timothy, uh, most of these are from Paul. A fellow worker, he's a beloved and faithful son, uh, Paul said, whom I, uh, who was you know, brought to birth in my chains. He was a fellow laborer in the gospel. He's a brother and minister of God. And he's referred to he who does the work of the Lord. And then in Philippians, Paul said this about him. He said, uh, I have no one like-minded who will sincerely care for your state. He says, you know his proven character that as a son with his father, he served with me in the gospel. What a great thing to say, as a son with his dad. And then also, we're, we're, we're not completely sure who the human author of the book of Hebrews is, but there is an interesting insight into Timothy there in the last chapter uh, where the author says, know that our brother Timothy has been set free, which of course just lets us know that at some point, and we don't know the circumstances, Timothy also spent some time uh, incarcerated in jail or prison. Now, one of the many unique things about this letter is that Paul, where he often says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, or Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, here presents himself, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus. Now, of course, he refers to himself as a prisoner of Jesus uh, more than more in other places than here uh, when he was writing from prison. But this is the only time that it's in the salutation and the opening verse where he declares himself, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus. So the thing that I want just quickly to look at that is Paul, uh, when he says a prisoner of Christ Jesus, there's something here for us because you see, you and I would say, wait a minute, Paul is a prisoner of Rome. That's, that's where we'd be. And, and it'd be like, yeah, he is. Rome got him. Rome put him in prison. He's a prisoner of Rome. But Paul didn't see it that way. Paul said, no, no, no. I'm not a prisoner of Rome. I'm a prisoner of Christ Jesus. You know, this may seem like, a, oh, we're just fighting over a, a minor thing. No, I believe that this mindset 
can make all the difference in your life and my life as believers following Jesus. Because here it's the circumstances of his life. We can, you can connect all the dots to how he ended up in prison. But we, we each have that in our lives, don't we? We have different things. We can connect some of the dots, some of the things that we can't. Here we are. Here we are in the days of COVID-19. Uh, <laughs> up until a couple of months ago, uh, we really couldn't connect those dots. <laughs> and, and here we are. We're affected by it. And, and my point is, as believers, we do not have to and should not see ourselves as simply living within the circumstances of our life, as if our lives are determined by natural causes only. But if we've given our life to Jesus, then, then we can say, well, <laughs> John, uh, in, uh, I, I'm now in the sheltering at home, by the will of Jesus Christ. Not because, well, California did the mandate and, you know, no, no. I'm here because this is where the Lord so seemed fit for me to be. So therefore, Lord, what do you got in this? It makes a difference. Okay, if the Lord's behind it, then God, you've got something in it. That doesn't mean he's the author of everything that comes our way, as Romans 8.28 says, for God causes all things to work together for good to those that love him and are called according to his purposes. Uh, that doesn't mean that all things are good, but there's something good in it for us. When we know that we're following Jesus, therefore, we can look at circumstances that way. So, so the issue is Rome or Jesus. You know, what Rome or Jesus. It makes all the difference. I mean, we have our favorite verses like Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He shall direct your path. Uh, I, many of you, like myself, this is like a key life verse. Uh, there's so many ways to apply it. But having it as a, a, a familiar verse that we like is different than saying, no, I actually am building my life on this. Therefore, I do believe that the Lord is directing my paths. Now, when I get willfully disobedient, when I, you know, flagrantly choose sin or break the law and those consequences, the Lord is not the author of that. But as I repent, that restores me to that place of then God's hand working in my circumstances, whatever brought me there. And therefore, I can then look at them once again as I am in the place of his purpose for my life. And so uh, that's why uh, Psalm 37, 23, another familiar uh, verse, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord and he delights in his way. You know, good man, well, how are we good? It's only through the gift of righteousness that's ours in Jesus Christ. But do you believe this? That your ways are ordered by the Lord? I love it when, when I discover I'm just kind of going and, oh, I have a, it's like to me, it's like, oh, I have a preference to do this today. I don't usually do that, but I'm going to do that. And then you discover, oh, that wasn't me thinking, oh, I just for some reason want to do this today. Somehow that was the Lord moving me to get there because he's got a divine appointment. It, it, it's just incredible. I mean, I needed a crank for my guitar a couple days ago because I wanted to change the strings and I, I'd sent my, the one that I had uh, back uh, to Bishop so I don't have it anymore. I thought, man, it makes such a difference. Um, I'm, I'm going to go down and see if the music store open. So I go there, and this is the age of COVID. I go, and there's, there, it feels like there's nobody there. There's a bunch of stuff spilled out on the ground. And then the owner comes in and realizes, well, he wasn't thinking hardly anybody would show up. Uh, so he was glad I was there. His daughter had been playing, so it's kind of a house store uh, musical situation. Anyway, uh, we got to talking, and he shared. He's genuinely in concerned as many people are uh, about his business. Is he going to go bankrupt? And this is the support for his family. And so uh, so I could feel that. And, I, and so I took time. I said, well, do you mind if I pray for you? And he said, sure. And so I got to pray for him. Well, I'm, I'm convinced that God was more uh, concerned or more interested in me going there and just praying uh, for the guy there. Uh, than he was whether I got my crank or I had to do it the old school way <laughs> in changing my strings. But uh, again, when we, 
when we can grasp this like Paul, the, you know, my life, the things of my life, it's not just the things of life. God is ordaining these things. Therefore, he has purpose in this. Uh, then we can be in that same place. It's the Old Testament version of Romans 8.28 and Genesis 50.20. When Joseph said to his brothers, But as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring it about as it is this day uh, to save many people alive. You know the story of Joseph. His brothers were jealous of him, and you know, so they couldn't say a kind word to him. And then finally... Uh, they just got him and said, we're just going to get rid of him. And they threw him in a cistern and were debating whether to just kill him, leave him there to die, kill him. And then some uh, Ishmaelites came by in a caravan. They thought, hey, you know, we can sell him. And that way we'll, he'll stay alive and we'll make some money off the deal. <laughs> so so they, they, they sell him. Now, uh, in the Genesis account, you don't get this, but the book of uh, Psalms fills in a few details that he was carried in chains, in pain, and he wept bitterly as they took him away then to Egypt. There in Egypt, then he becomes a slave in a, a high-ranking official's household, and he was faithful and trusted, and then what? He's falsely accused. Just as for, you know, he was falsely thrown in, to the jail, uh, into the cistern and sold. Now he's falsely accused and thrown into jail. And, you know, the story that we see in him is he saw that the Lord's hand was where he was. Did he want to get out of jail? Absolutely. He said, you know, to the baker and the cup, uh, the, the uh, I went blank on it, the, the wine, wine bearer, thank you. The, the, you know, please uh, remember me. But he didn't just sit there and, oh, woe is me, here I am, oh no. No, he said, you know, I belong to the Lord. The Lord's got his hand in here. I'm going to just do what's right where I am with the resources I have. And what about you? You can look at the things you can't do or the ways you're hindered or, you know, this or that. Or you can say, what do I have? You know, that the Lord's big on that. He's big on saying, like he said to Moses, so what's that in your hand? Oh, well, it's a staff. Okay, watch what I can do with that staff. And boom, uh, you know the story of Exodus. Uh, he uses the staff as kind of the instrument to do miracles, ultimately to part the sea. But the principle was that was the most common, useful, simple thing that Moses had, that if you said, Moses... Uh, you know, you're going to do mighty things with that staff. He'd say, are you kidding? It's every shepherd's got one of those. It's just ultimately just a stick. Well, you know, why don't you see what God can do? Don't, don't look at what seems to be little. Just give it God and watch him. Say, Lord, well, let's see, that's how I came to Jesus. When I came to Jesus, my life was broken. I had searched and searched. I couldn't find anything. Finally, when I thought, I think, I think. Jesus, I think you're real. And I went to him and I said, Lord, I, I think you're it. I think you're real. And if you are, I, I told him, you can have my life. I've made a mess of it. If you can do anything with it, it's yours. Man, I've since learned the Lord loves that. <laughs> and he's like, so how about you? You may seem it's little. Give it to the Lord. Watch, watch what he he will do. Okay, so <laughs> from verse 1, not even finished with verse 1. Okay, that's the from uh, Paul and Timothy. Now we're going to get the twos. And again, a lot of this is just the initial greetings here. Some, some of this will go a little bit faster. But here's the, our, our key, one of our two key uh, persons in this letter, other than, of course, Paul. But it's to Philemon, our beloved friend, which I love the word in the Greek here, it's agapetos. We know agape or agape, uh, agape love. Uh, and, and so this is the word, say, my, my agaped uh, one, the one that I, I love with an agape love. Wonderful word, I love that. To our beloved friend, but also he recognizes Philemon as a fellow laborer. 
Uh, and we'll see that as we go forward. The various ways that Philemon, you know, was not just a brother in the Lord, but how he then was serving the Lord and how he was using those things that the Lord had entrusted to him. And in his case, he was wealthy, had quite a lot entrusted to him, and he was using it for the Lord. So to Philemon, our beloved friend and fellow laborer. And then verse two, to the beloved Aphia. Now, uh, beloved here is against, uh, again, agapeta. So, you know, my agaped, my agapid uh, friend uh, and to the agapid Aphia. Now we believe uh, in the context, it's pretty clear that Aphia would be Philemon's wife and, uh, and her name meant fruitful. So what a nice name, fruitful and the wife of Philemon. So then next he's, he refers to Archippus, our fellow soldier. Now, fellow soldier, in a way, is a little bit stronger than fellow laborer, as he referred to Philemon. A soldier would include just that further idea of enlisting in the uh, specific uh, calling of the Lord. Now, Archippus, we believe, is the son of Philemon and Aphia. But not only that, that he was probably uh, one of the local pastors uh, there in the church, somebody who ministered in the church in Colossia. Matter of fact, in the closing, Paul's closing to his letter to the church in Colossia, in chapter 4, verse 17, uh, he writes this. He says, And say to Archippus, Take heed to the ministry which you have received. So he had a ministry. It was known by Paul even that he'd received it. Take heed to the ministry which you have received in the Lord that you may fulfill it. He's given him a, a little helpful uh, exhortation. Hey, hey uh, you know, Archippus, uh, keep at it. Keep at it. You know, we see in his letters to Timothy, he had to do the same with Timothy. Kind of, you know, hey, Timothy, remember the prophecies that were prayed over you. You know, remember God's given us not a spirit of timidity, but of love and power and a sound mind. And, and so we all can use that, you know. We all can use those, hey, get up and go for it. I often refer uh, or think of Joshua, you know, when he's whining before the Lord and, and the, the Lord shows up, you know, as the commander of the army of the Lord. And he says, what are you doing down there? You know, he just says, you know, get up, get back to work. So, uh, and then finally, uh, it's also is addressed to uh, the church in your house, to Philemon, Aphia, Archippus, and to the church in your house, which there again, we know and realize that they had a church in their house, which we're doing right now in a very different way, aren't we? It's cool that I can be there with you at your home, and, uh, and, and I, I hope you're able to just give this time to Together, we're giving this focus uh, to the Word and uh, to this time setting apart to worship the Lord. Uh, through this uh, media, we'll be able to be together, but uh, we're having church in our home, which, by the way, while you're home, uh, don't limit it to just the times that we're offering online. And we'll be, by the way, continuing to explore uh, other ways. A lot of that depends on how long this goes on and as we discover our options. <laughs> Uh, I have a list server where we keep uh, track of a lot of the um, the uh, pastors and a lot of the churches are like we have scrambling to get this stuff going. We've been blessed to have Rhea uh, and it keeps us ab uh, above the uh, uh, kind of ahead of the curve. But, but take this time, listen to worship music, pray, read the word and reach out. So verse 3, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Very familiar greeting. Um, but some reminders are here, of course, that grace, grace, grace comes from God through Jesus Christ. And it's only when we have uh, received and are experiencing and abiding in the grace of God, that undeserved blessing and favor of God, that we experience peace, peace which we all the world craves. Not just world peace, because world peace in itself doesn't bring personal peace. Personal peace comes through Jesus. Oh man, 
when I was looking, trying to find out what's what, what's the ultimate reality, all the things I tried on, it was tried, to, yeah, tried on, tried out. And it was like I had this nagging energy at the back of my head, no peace. Um, and then I found Jesus. Wow. Now, I've been following him. I just calculated the other day. I've been following him for 50 years. Oop, 50 years, yeah. Did I date myself? Yeah, 50 years. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Thank you, Lord. So it's from God, our Father, a reminder that we approach God as our Father, as the, the famous prayer, our Father who art in heaven. But also we must come to him as Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ, and you serve the Lord Jesus. So Paul goes, again, as he often does, he says, I thank my God, uh, making mention of you always in my prayers. And uh, this is common to Paul in his opening to the Philippians 1.3. He says, I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. So that was, you know, he had that attitude. He was thoughtful of folks and he was thanking uh, the Lord for them. Now, so if we just took a quick look at what kind of insight do we get into Paul's uh, prayers here, you know, in my prayers, well, number one, he, he thanks God. And number two, he mentions, he says, I make mention of you. That's specific. So, so a quick uh, note here is that Paul's prayers were both thankful and specific. Thankful and specific. Uh, it's like uh, that familiar passage in Philippians 4, uh, 6 and 7. It says, do not be anxious about anything. But in everything with prayer, that's a general word, and petition, that means specific requests, and thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God that passes all understanding will guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. So, uh, so here we see another example of that. He's, he's thankful, as we should be, um, and he's specific. Um, you know, it's fine to say, Lord, you know, please meet my needs. But, but we're also especially encouraged to say, well, list what those needs are. What is that specific thing that's causing you to pray that general prayer and take the time to bring that specifically to the Lord? Among other things, um, specific requests are, when we make our requests specific, it's easier to identify the specific answer. And then that encourages us, encourages us in our faith and our prayers. So what about our prayers? You know, who or what are we thankful for? Uh, who do you mention by name in your prayers? Lord, uh, help us to be thankful and more specific in our prayers. Now he goes on in verse 5 and in a sense is talking some, uh, about more of what he is specifically thankful for concerning Philemon. Uh, he says, hearing of your love and faith. You know, I'm thankful to God because I've heard of your love and faith, which you have towards the Lord Jesus and toward all the saints. Now, one of the things here is that, he, that Paul, all the way back in Rome, is saying, you know, I'm, I'm hearing, Philemon, of your love and faith, that you have faith in Jesus, but also you're loving the saints. And, and that's significant. We don't want to just gloss by that. That means that you know, you know how James said, well, you say you got faith? Show me your faith. Well, Philemon is one who, who his faith was seen in his acts, in the way that he loved the saints. And he's going to elaborate on that a little bit more. But hearing of your love and faith, which you have towards the, love, the Lord Jesus. So how about you and I? Is our faith, you know, as some uninformed say, well, faith is a personal thing that you should just keep to yourself. No way. Uh, if it's real, then it's going to affect your life. And if it's affecting your life, it's going to be seen. Now, that's not something seen where we compare, well, how is it seen in Joe's life as opposed to how is it seen in Sally's life? No, no. But it'll be seen in your life uh, from where you were when you first came to Jesus. And, and it should be increasing in our life. And here we see that. Uh, and that we, might, we might say he had a reputation 
a good reputation for uh, genuine faith. And look, we know that the Christians get a bad rap and we know that unfortunately there's a lot of things done in the name of the Lord that, that, that the enemy amplifies and uh, gives Christians a bad name and, and creates stereotypes. Uh, and then what the enemy wants to do in those, you know, our brothers and sisters, those of us that are just seeking to be real in following Jesus, is to, to intimidate us from sharing our faith, thinking, well, they're just going to just put me in the category of this stereotype or that stereotype. But you know what? Don't let that stop you because the world sees the real thing. They see it in humility. They see it in your genuine love for Jesus and just let it shine. That's why, you know, kind of talk about the music store. It can be such simple ways that we can demonstrate those things. Uh, just thoughtfulness, kindness, and where appropriate, praying for people. It's always appropriate to pray for them, but to pray for them sometimes right then where they are. So verse 6, he says that the sharing of your faith may become effective by the acknowledgement of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. Now this, in a sense, is the essence of, of a prayer on Paul's part for Philemon. Now, this is a little bit uh, a difficult verse because in the Greek it can be uh, equally legitimately uh, understood in two different ways. The one that we have here in the New King James would be, we would summarize uh, what I just read there as basically this. Uh, knowing the good things we have in Jesus makes us more effective as we live out. Sharing here actually has the idea of koinonia. As we live out our walk with Jesus. And yeah, that makes sense. Uh, but there's another way that this can be understood. The NIV translates that. And so reading from the NIV, the same verse, verse 6, uh, says, I pray that you may be active in sharing your faith so that you may have a, you will have a full understanding of every good thing we have in Christ. Um, now, what that would be summarized as is this, sharing our faith causes us to grow in our understanding, grow and increase in our understanding of every good thing we have in Jesus. And so the legitimate question is, well, which is it? Well, I would suggest it's both. That's one of the things I love about Greek. Greek can be so specific that there's only one uh, honest possible way to understand it. Or Greek can be very pregnant with nuanced meanings. And I tend to believe that in most of those cases where we find that, when you compare it with other statements in Scripture, that often the, each of those multiple ways of understanding a verse are legitimate and are uh, confirmed elsewhere. And I would say the same here. Uh, it's a cyclical, isn't it? In other words, uh, when I know the good things that I have in Jesus, obviously sharing with others, sharing the, what I've discovered about the goodness of Jesus, that's going to make me more effective in sharing. But there's something about that process of sharing our lives with others that we grow through that process and then I discover and experience more of the good things that I have in Jesus Christ. So it all works together in that way. Well, finally, that brings us to uh, our closing verse for today, verse 7. And so Paul said, For we have great joy and consolation uh, in your love. What a great thing for Paul to say. You know, we have great joy. It's interesting because the word uh, translated joy here is actually grace. And so the idea here is, uh, I have a great experience of God's grace because of you, my brother. Think about that. Uh, it says, uh, in your love. So he's saying, there's something about your love, the way that it's acted out, that to me is an expression of God's grace. And so there's the, the joy that comes with experiencing God's grace. Uh, the second is consolation. That's that familiar word, paraclesis, for uh, consolation, encouragement, comfort. There, But there again, I, I, I'm encouraged. I'm comforted. You know, by watching you. And that's one of the reasons the Lord wants us to be in community when we come to Jesus. Because we are encouraged by watching each other. We learn from one another as we follow Jesus.
Now, he said, in your love, and here's a, a specific expression of it. How does his love look at practice? He says, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed by you, brother. And I like this word refreshed because basically the idea with that is having the blessing of a good rest, the blessing and strength. You know, when you wake up after you've just had a really unusually good night's sleep and there's just something that feels so good or just a good rest. Uh, it's neat to think now that you're just like encouragement can give strength. You know, the way that we minister to others can, can give them the strength of, of the equivalent of a good night's rest. That sounds good to me. <laughs> It sounds good as something that we can pass on to others. And then finally, Paul refers to him, uh, have been refreshed by you, brother. He started out with, uh, you know, beloved friend, and he ends up with brother as we come to the conclusion of this warm uh, welcome and greeting uh, from Paul uh, to these friends that he's knowing uh, there in Colossae. But of course, it's all in preparation for... Uh, this kind of delicate situation uh, that Paul's going to bring to them, this request he has on behalf of Onesimus. So uh, it's good to ask ourselves, who are we encouraging and who are we uh, refreshing? Uh, and maybe take a moment to think now, who might we encourage and refresh? Right now, it may be a, just a phone call to somebody who's feeling a little lonely or isolated with the stay-at-home order. Uh, you know, what can we do to refresh them? Maybe we can offer to pick up some stuff at the store for them or uh, run some errand that would help them. And, and so then you go not, just don't let it stop with who you might uh, refresh or encourage, who will you? you know, just take a moment and think about that. Who will you uh, encourage and refresh? All right, let's pray. Lord, thank you so much that we can come together in this way in this time. As always, Lord, I just ask that the things that I've shared that are of you and of your word would be the things that would remain. Anything that's not, Lord, would like chaff just simply be blown away. Lord, I thank you for your people, for my brothers and sisters, and how we can connect in this way. Lord, help us to be those that bring encouragement and refreshment to others. Help us, Lord, teach us uh, to be more specific in our prayers. A and Lord, help us to understand that as those who are your children, following you, that we can know that you have purpose in whatever circumstances we find ourselves in life. May we not just believe that, Lord, but may we embrace that and, and look with anticipation at how you want to use us in spite of ourselves, but use us nonetheless in the circumstances in our lives. All this, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to continue to leave uh, the feed up for a few more moments that that will then allow us to, to have uh, some comments. And so that way I'm able to be on with you and we can have uh, dialogue and discussion and any response. I mean, if there's something that really struck you or anything like that, please go ahead and uh, get active in the comments together. We can stay together in that way. So uh, as far as the, the next e-service, we'll see you Thursday at 7 o'clock here in the YouTube uh, channel. Be sure to subscribe. God bless you.